Good morning, church family. Good to see everyone this morning. Let's all stand as we sing this morning. Skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem gray all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend, trusting his promise is grand. You gotta sing and you'll be happy today. Press along to the goal. Trust in him who leadeth the way. He is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong. Look to Jesus and pray. Come on and lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Off we fell to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky. When it seems the fortunes of earth frown and pass us by, and there are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust him each day, we shall have pleasures untold. You gotta sing and we'll be happy today. Press along to the goal. Trust in him who leadeth the way. He is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong. Jesus and pray. Come on and lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. And we're singing, he has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. And we're singing, he has made me glad. And he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. Me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemy. You know the Lord liveth and blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth and blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. In Jesus Christ he died for me and he took away my sin. I will live with him for eternity. Come on, church. You know the Lord liveth. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord. Please be seated. Good morning, church family. It's great to see you here. Thank you that you have joined us today. Please stick around after worship for a minute and give us a chance to visit with you. We would love to get to know you better. 
Uh, and to help that happen, small groups have been started and they're meeting today and some are here, some are in homes and uh, being in a small group allows us to become closer and get to know one, each other on a deeper level. I was telling some people in the office that one, two weeks ago I learned more about people in our group and got to know them better than I could have in a year in a normal setting. Uh, so those are a blessing to us. So if you're not in one, you can contact the office and you can be put in one by Matthew or Lillian or you can show up and someone will put you in one until you can be assigned to a group. Uh, may the gracious love of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all today. Uh, we have some new members uh, that we need to recognize today. If they're here, Mr. Steve and Miss Barbara Jones, if you would stand up. Let's give them a warm welcome. Also, we have a second family, Lucas, Ellie, and Shep Sudreth, that are with us today. I know they're here because I've seen them. Will you stand up, please? Come on, stand up. We are very glad that you have joined us, and uh, y'all be sure as members to make them feel welcome, not just today, but in the weeks to come, in the months to come. Uh, let's help get them plugged into our congregation. Speaking of that, Goodman Oaks, G Goodman Oaks 101 is a class for new members and prospective members. It'll be next Sunday right after services. Lunch will be provided for those that join it. And uh, if you've just been visiting and you're not sure what you want to do, you can still come and we'll have some presentations from the ministers. Matthew will lead it and we'll have presentations from other people and you'll get to learn more about our congregation and our beliefs and missions, and I think it'll be a great thing. I know it was helpful to Billy and I back then when we joined. It was a class over four weeks, and I think the way Matthew's doing it now, although that was beneficial, this is much more personal, and we get to know each other better. So please join us next Sunday for that. Uh, in September, we're bringing back the children's ministry to Cathlon. I just want to mention it because we started it between some of the COVID shutdowns that never really got off the ground. This is going to be for the first graders through the sixth graders. It consists of 10 different items or lists or sets of verses for our children to memorize. We're going to work with them on Wednesday nights on this, and Jonathan and Matthew have both looked over it, and they helped me tweak it and got it uh, better. But it's things that both of them think will are safe for sure will help them coming into the youth group and later in adult classes as well. And we'll be sending some information home for parents to do that. When your children complete that, that will be a plaque that we'll put their name up on. Uh, so you'll be seeing more information about that to come. Uh, you can go to church track and you can register your attendance there by signing in and registering your attendance. You can also get one of the cards in the back of the pew in front of you. Uh, the green card is for members, and we have switched to a white connection card for our visitors, and it's got information on front and back just so we get to know you a little bit better. And you can place those in the black boxes either on either side of the auditorium or at the back as well. Also, your contribution can go in there, and there are many ways to contribute now. Uh, during communion, after communion, we don't pass it around the tray anymore, but we do have many ways such as church track, black boxes. You can do a bank draft, or you can drop it by the office. Our bulletin is full of information, and we'll not try to go over any more of it, but there are things there that you just take it and read it, and you'll see different events coming up. And um, if you're not receiving the bulletin for some reason, please let us know by contacting the office by phone or emailing us at office at goodmanoaks.com. Our scripture reading for this morning comes from Psalms chapter 66, verses 1 through 6. Psalms 66, 1 through 6. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come crying, cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in, in his deeds toward the children of man. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There did we rejoice in him. This is God's word. I know this will be mentioned later on in the service, but I thought I'd mention that uh, the Buck family is very close to me. I graduated with Helen 
and uh, Heather was right be behind her. And uh, uh, as you know, there, there was a, a lot of you know that there was a, a, a wreck the other day that uh, took the life of Medley. That was uh, Helen's, well, Heather's daughter, only daughter, and, and Helen's uh, niece, and Miss Sandra Buck, too, is grand, that was, uh, her granddaughter. So uh, I'd like to say a quick prayer in behalf of the family, if you don't mind, if you bow with me, please. Dear God, we thank you for everything we do, you do for us, and God, we love you. We love you with all our hearts, and, and we, we don't understand things that happen in life, um, whether it be the death of a loved one from COVID to a traffic accident from the other night. Um, Lord, we're, we know we're not guaranteed tomorrow, um, but we live for today. We, li we love you, and we thank you for all you do with us. Help, help uh, this family cope with what they're going through. Uh, help us to uh, rally around them, and uh, we pray for comfort and for strength at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. This song was requested um, last week. Haven't done it in a long time, so... Um, sweet, sweet spirit. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face and I know they feel the presence of the Lord sweet Holy Spirit sweet with your love and for these blessings we lift our hearts in praise without a doubt we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place. It's very high. Let's we'll lower that. There are blessings you cannot receive till you know him in his fullness and be to profit when you say I am going to walk with Jesus all the way sweet Holy Spirit sweet heavenly with your love and for these blessings we lift our hearts in praise without a doubt we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place. Good 
good morning. Just uh, wanting to take a glimpse out there and see some of the family of God now. Excuse me, I, I don't know all the protocol for uh, opening prayer. Don't mean it to be a distraction, but did want to let uh, you know and confess I'm not the person that I ought to be. I'm not the person that I'm gonna be. And thankfully with Jesus, I'm gonna be better. And uh, I think that's true for all of us. I'm thankful for the grace that Jesus offers us. And I praise God for his name. And uh, I thank him for the church here and everybody, the new members, thank for y'all came aboard. And uh, just keep on holding on to Jesus. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now thanking you for all your love, all your goodness. We're thankful for your wisdom and your strength. Dear Lord, please be with this church here and the leadership that we have, we appreciate the time and effort the elders have put in for their families, the support that they have from their wives and their families and from us, help us to get along, help us to love each other and to love you Whenever we approach you as a family, we also think about those here that are with us and those that are able to join online and on the phone conference. And we know there's different levels of emotions, different things going on in life. We know that there are joyous occasions that are occurring and there's also, there's pain and there's suffering wherever we may be in this scope, help us to realize that you are the most important. You are with us and you love us. And thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Thank you, I appreciate that. I think last week, I know we had Russo and all that had a lot of visitors, but I first time I've seen a five in front of a, a zero last week. Uh, we I think we had roughly 500 people here last week, so that was uh, that's very encouraging since uh, COVID. When I was standing up here with nobody, empty pews, and not knowing which way to go, but I um, appreciate you you guys and your voices, and I appreciate this church. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength my shield to you alone may my spirit yield you alone are my heart's desire and i long to worship you i want you more than gold or silver only you can satisfy you alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye you alone are my strength my shield to you alone May my spirit yield. You alone are.
are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. Yes, I long to worship you, Lord, I long to worship you. Good morning. This scripture reading is going to be in Luke, starting in chapter 10, verse 1. That's Luke, chapter 10, verse 1. <clears throat> After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bags, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. <clears throat> Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. This is God's word. God. Deeper than the ocean and wider than the sea is the grace of the Savior for sinners like me. Sin from the Father, and it thrills my soul just to feel and to know that his blood makes me whole. His grace reaches me, yes, his grace reaches me. And twill last through eternity. Now I'm under his control, and I'm happy in my soul just to know his grace reaches me. Higher than the mountains and brighter than the sun, it was all for a Calvary for everyone. Greatest of treasures, and it's mine today. Though my sins were as scarlet, he has washed them away. And his grace reaches me, yes, his grace reaches me, and will last through eternity. Now I'm under his control, and I'm happy in my soul just to know that his grace reaches me. Sing it, church. His grace reaches me. Yes, his grace. 
Good morning. I'm kind of filled up with the spirit right now. I was listening to the announcements. We lost the memory here's child through a car accident. And that's sad. I'm not a song leader. But I asked you to turn to 313, and I asked Todd if he would, as part of the script for the communion, if you will lead us in verse 1 and 4. A hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and blessed for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. To the old rugged cross I will let be true it shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share sing it church so I'll cherish till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange. Thank you so much, Todd. In First Peter, chapter two, the Bible says.
he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray. But now we have returned to the shepherd and owner of your sins. The old rugged cross. <clears throat> What does it say? To me, the old rugged cross says, Christ's death was on the cross, and those who turn to him are delivered from the penalty of sin. The cross says again, through Christ's death on the cross, those who have returned to him have delivered from the power of sin. When we think of these words, and we think of this emblem before us, we think of the song that we were just singing. Only one person went on that cross for all of us in the world. I read up there, it said about a half a mile of a cross that weighed pretty close to over 700 pounds. After being beaten, whipped on his back. I don't know how Jesus did it, but he did it for us. And that's why I want us to think about as we get ready to take of the supper and the brothers will come at this time. Shall we pray? Our God and our Father in heaven, hallowed be your holy and message name. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior, for he who went on the cross in place of us, for his life on the cross, we have freedom today. We have this privilege now to take of this bread and this cup which is a like representation of what he did on the cross for us. May we never forget <clears throat> all that Jesus has done for us. Father, we love you and we thank you. In his name we pray, amen.
Let us pray for our cup. Father in heaven, once more we come before you. We want to remember not on this this day, but every day of the blood that came from the side of Jesus that he gave out for our sins. As we take of this cup today and represent, may we always remember why he did it, because he loved us so. In Jesus we pray, amen. Now about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collection will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give them letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem if it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. There are black boxes on each side of our building for those who of us who have our offerings to give today. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this church. We thank you for its leadership, our elders, deacons, preachers, and our teachers, and each member of the church that we come as one. At this time, we pray that as we give, we we'll get out of the abundance of our hearts, knowing that we're reaching out to help others. Bless us now as we sit at the feet of he who would preach to us that may give us some nuggets to take us through the next week. In Jesus we pray, amen. Thank you, James. Let's dismiss our children to children's churches at this time as we stand and hold to God's unchanging hand. Let's stand and sing. Time is filled with swift transition. Not of earth unmoved can stand. And build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. Come on and hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. And build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Trust in him who will not leave you. 
whatsoever years may bring, if by earthly friends forsaken, still more closely to him cling, you got to hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. Come on and hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. And build your hopes on things eternal. Oh, to God's unchanging hand. When your journey is completed, if to God you have been true, fair and bright the home in glory, your enraptured soul real view. Hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. Hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. And build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Please be seated. Word is written in the book of Luke, chapter 10, verses 13 through 20. Woe unto you, Chorazin, woe unto Bethsaida, for I mighty works, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in salt, sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Captain. Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. The one who hears you hears me. The one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said unto them, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Morning, church. My name is Matthew Crow. I'm the preacher here at Goodman Oaks Church of Christ. To those who are visiting, um, to the members, long time no preach. Good to see you all again. Uh, before I start, I want to say one thing about small groups tonight. We do have our small groups on the first and third Sundays of each month. That's how we're doing it right now. And uh, just if you're a visitor, you're welcome to come to our small groups. Uh, there, some have changed times. There are, I know, at least a couple who are meeting here right after worship. So if you want to test out a small group, if you just want to go to one and see what it's like, you're welcome to do that. I'm sure they will be more than happy to share their meal with you and to share that time with you. If you want more information about them or where else they are meeting, you can come see me, and I'll let you know what that, what's going on there uh, later on. Will you pray for me, please? My Lord, my God, I firmly believe that you are here and that you see me and that you hear me, Lord. And Lord, this morning I ask that you will give me clarity of mind. Lord, I ask that you will give me compassion of heart. I ask, Lord, that you will give me gospel courage and preaching power, that I may not fear the faces of those to whom I preach, that I may say all things to your glory and that for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. It is better to burn out than fade away. Those were some of the last words of Kurt Cobain, written on a note in his greenhouse shortly before he took his own life. 
He had experienced a meteoric rise to fame and fortune in the early 90s as the front man for the Seattle-based band Nirvana, and, uh, which still has a cult following 30 year, almost 30 years later to this day. Why on earth would a man at 27 years old, the prime of his life, at the height of his powers, at the pinnacle of fame and fortune, turn around and take his own life? Those words he wrote, it is better to burn out than fade away, doesn't sound like the words of a man who has it all, does it? It sounds like the words of a man who lost it all. Or perhaps better, a man who's lost what is important. You see, for Kurt Cobain, fame and fortune admittedly were not important to him or were not the main importance. He himself said, there is nothing I love more than pure underground music. That was, you could say that was his love. We might even say that was his purpose. That was his mission, was to enjoy and to make pure underground music. He railed against all the popular top 40 artists. He railed against the manufactured hair metal bands of the 80s. You know, he despised his peers, even my beloved Pearl Jam. He said that they were corporate puppets hopping on the alternative bandwagon. Comments that he later retracted, I should say, by the way. This guy's whole MO was being a musical contrarian in a way. He was counter-cultural. He was anti-establishment. So what was it that changed for Kurt Cobain? You know, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know the inner workings of his life. I do know he had some problems, you know. He had, a lot, he had addiction problems. I mean, he had addiction, trauma, Courtney Love. You know, he had lots of problems in his life. I'm glad somebody got that. Thank you. <laughs> but he, many are agreed that this was the main problem that contributed to this life-ending decision. His anti-establishment music had become establishment. His countercultural ideology had become status quo. His alternative music had become mainstream. In other words, Kurt Cobain lost his purpose. He was disconnected from his mission, and as a result, he felt he was fading into irrelevance. I didn't come here today to talk to you about 90s alternative music, although I could. I came here to tell you that I'm worried. I'm worried that the same thing that happened to Kurt Cobain is happening to the church. I'm scared, church, that the church is drifting from its purpose, that we are becoming disconnected from our mission, and that we are, in reality, fading into irrelevance. Jesus here is on a mission. And for us to be disconnected from our mission means that we are, in some ways, in a wrong relationship with our mission field. What happens when a countercultural church starts looking like the culture around us? What happens when the church starts looking more like the world around us instead of the Christ who sent us? We become disconnected from our mission. If our purpose is to announce the kingdom of God, what happens when the church gets so enmeshed in the kingdoms of men? We will become disconnected. We will lose our purpose. What happens when a countercultural church goes mainstream? You do know the church is intended to be countercultural, don't you? I mean, you do know that Jesus was countercultural, don't you? I mean, Jesus upset apple carts all over Galilee and Samaria and Judea. This was a king who was born in a feeding trough. This was a country prophet who stood before kings. He was a rabbi who ate with tax collectors and sinners. This was a man who, at the height of his power, rejected power. This was a man who, when people wanted to make him king, he said weird things to upset them like, Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. He rejected all the things the culture had to offer. 
And friends, if we are going to be on mission with Christ, so must we. If we are going to get on with Jesus, we cannot look like the world. We cannot act like the world. We cannot value what the world values. And in this text this morning, Jesus shows us how he sends us on a mission. And I want to tell you specifically, for us to be a countercultural church like our countercultural Christ, I see three things here that we must counter, like Jesus counters. We must first counter the fake peace of the world. Jesus gave these 72 disciples some very clear instructions. He said, I am sending you as sheep in the midst of wolves. So he had been welcomed in many places, but the more Jesus preached, the more folks understood what he really is saying, the less they got on with Jesus. And so they start rejecting him. He had just been rejected in Samaria. Some village, they rejected him. You know, they wanted to call down fire on that village. They didn't like that. And so he tells them, guys, it's getting rough, all right? The culture is not your friend. This is a dangerous time. You will be vulnerable. You will not be comfortable on mission with Christ. And that's why he gives these weird instructions. That's why he says, do not take your money. Do not take your bag. This ain't a time to go shopping with the girls. Do not greet anybody on the road. This ain't a time to hang with your boys, okay? Do not go socializing. Eat what is before you, he says, because when he is going on a mission, it is getting dangerous. When Christ sends us on a mission, we have to be aware it may be dangerous. We are not in the exact same position because this is zero hour. This is, he's going to the cross. It is all coming to a head right here in this moment. But we must be aware we are on a mission and it is dangerous. When he said, go into a house and say, peace be to this house, that ain't some nice little greeting. Y'all don't know how dangerous that is. Peace is another word for salvation in, in Luke, okay? So when, it, when they say salvation has come to your house, they're saying Jesus has come to your house. And when they say Jesus is, you know what happens? People reject Jesus as they're already starting to do. And so when he says peace be to your house, that is a countercultural peace because they look for peace in other places than Christ. And when you say that peace is in Christ, everybody who finds peace, peace everywhere else, they will not like that. That's what's behind this condemnation of these Galilean cities, Chorazin and Bethsaida, in verses 13 and 14. Jesus says it's better for them, you know, it's better for more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon, these pagan cities. Do you know that Jesus, the Son of God, walked on the streets of these cities? Do you know that the, the precious Son of God laid his holy hands on the sick people in their towns? Do you know that there, the voice of Christ went into their ears from his mouth and they still didn't welcome him? They still rejected him. And so he says, like, even Eli you know, Elijah went to Tyre and Sidon. He had a widow there who repented and heard the word of God. It is better for them than for these folks. You would think after all they heard, after all they saw, they would welcome him with open arms. But friends, it shows us there are people in this world, no matter what they see, no matter what they hear, they will not welcome Christ. It doesn't matter how many gas cards you give out. doesn't matter how nice you are. doesn't matter how many preachers go to talk so-and-so. If it's not in their heart to receive Christ, they ain't going to do it. All right? We need to know we are sheep going out in the midst of wolves. The culture will never be friends with the church. It's not going to happen, okay? While y'all are waiting on the world to be your friends, I want to save you some time and tell you they are never going to be your friends. This culture around us is hell-bent against the things of God. It is becoming increasingly archaic and backwards and not on the right side of history to have a Christian worldview in this culture. They will say, you are the problem. 
when you don't want your kids hearing what the world says about sexuality and gender and identity. You are the problem when you say that three-letter word that's becoming a four-letter word in our culture, S-I-N. You are the ones who are being repressive and intolerant while their intolerance is on full display. Friends, you cannot be friends with the world because that will put you in enmity with God. James 4, verse 4. We should never be surprised when the culture doesn't welcome Jesus. I mean, some of y'all act surprised about this. Oh, there's this culture around us. Did he not tell us in the world you will have tribulation? Do not be surprised when the world rejects Christ. Here's what should surprise you. When the church doesn't welcome Christ. See, our biggest problem is not that there are people out there who don't believe what we say. Our biggest problem, there are people in here who do not believe what we say. Y'all know where you've been. I know where you've been. You, we know where we each other been. There, God has pulled you out of beds you shouldn't have been in. God has pulled words out of your mouths you shouldn't have been saying. God has pulled things out of your hands. You shouldn't have been smoking and swallowing and drinking. God has pulled you out of people's lives. God has snatched you from the fires of hell, but you are hell-bent on going back to it. You go to look for peace where there is no peace. Friends, I want to tell you, true peace comes from the name Jesus Christ, not Jack Daniels. True rest comes from the promises of Christ, not a pill called Xanax, all right? I'm not mad at your church, okay? We all need a little help sometimes, okay? But how often do we numb ourselves to the vulnerability in which Christ places us in our mission? We are sheep in the midst of wolves, and we run for peace wherever we can get that. But I want to tell you this morning, church, you will not find peace anywhere but with the Prince of of peace. Fake peace. We have to reject fake peace. I want to tell you also, church, number two, we have to reject false divisions. There's a detail here you may not have noticed. I didn't notice this for a long I didn't know what it meant for a long time. Jesus sends out 72 disciples. You know, numbers are important in the Bible. Uh, in books like Ezekiel and Daniel and Revelation, numbers carry a very heightened symbolic meaning, you know. Uh, they're very, very important and symbolic. Even in the narratives of the gospel, historical narratives, they're important. Jesus had 12 apostles. That's not a coincidence. There were 12 sons of Jacob who were the foundation of Israel. Jesus is symbolically saying, this is the new Israel. All right. 72, though, where does that come from? Now, if you are a careful reader of the Bible, and let's face it, we're not real careful readers of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, you know. You start seeing names and lists and numbers. You're like, oh, let's skip over that. Let's get to the good stuff, you know. Y'all do, do. You know you do that. Don't like you don't do that. These read, they would get to Genesis chapter 10 and see this table of nations, this list of all the nations that rose from Noah and his sons. And those careful, they would count those numbers up. In the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, they counted 72 nations. Later on in history, when the Hebrew text was translated into Greek in the Septuagint, the legend has it, the legendary letter of Aristius, which is not you know, historically verified, it said there were 72 translators of the Hebrew into Greek, the language of the world, you know. There are other non-canonical Jewish books, Third Enoch, that say there are 72 languages and all these things. The point is, the number 72 means everybody. So Jesus sending out 72 disciples is a symbolic representation of where the mission is going to go. It will go to everybody. It's even here. Korades and Bethsaida are tired inside and will be more tolerable for them than these Galilean Jewish cities because the mission of Christ is not provincial it is not regional it is not ethnocentric the mission of Christ is for everybody on earth I gotta ask you church is Goodman Oaks a church on a mission for everybody on earth y'all aren't ready for this okay I gotta tell y'all this though 
I had a, uh, several years ago, I heard a statistic that troubled me deeply. I heard this. I was not at all surprised by it. I was angered by this, though. I was sickened by the statistic I heard. It was by a professor at Harding School of Theology years ago. He's not even there anymore. But he traveled around the church quite a bit. Okay, he got around the Church of Christ in the South, all over the country, all over the world. He was a world traveler. And he, he noticed this, this, this consistency in American churches of Christ. Okay? And he shared, he noticed the same thing tends to happen. Now, y'all aren't ready for this. God give me grace. I'm going to use a metaphor. Okay? There are different flavors of churches. Y'all know this, right? We, we could say there are some vanilla churches. Can I say that, church? There are some chocolate churches. Can I say that? You keep looking and there'll be some other flavors of church, all kinds of churches, you know. This man noticed a, a similarity. He says, in predominantly vanilla churches of Christ, when they get to be about 20% chocolate, Y'all know what happens? Y'all okay, know what happens. Y'all know what happens. The vanilla starts to vanish. Now, it's never said, they never say, this is never called what it is, okay? Instead, it has said things like, well, we are just not comfortable here anymore. It's just not the way it was. It's not the way it used to be. Or the worst of all, it doesn't feel like home anymore. And I just think, fools, fools, do you not know where your home is? Have y'all forgot? Have some of us forgotten where our home is? Because our citizenship is not in the provincial places of this earth. It is not in the regional places. It is not in the ethnocentric divisions of our fallen world. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the man, the Lord Christ Jesus, who is our peace, who made both of us one, Ephesians 2, who in his body broke down that hostility, that dividing wall between us. I know, church, I know. We're all, we're brought up in these divisions. I didn't ask for it. You didn't ask for it either, I know. But here's what we do. We get too comfortable in these divisions, don't we? We get too comfortable with our flavor of church. And it may be the case that a multi-ethnic church makes you uncomfortable. And if that's the case, friends, i got to tell you this morning, you better get comfortable with that. Okay? This is not some threat, okay? This is not some social commentary. This is not some demographic study. I come to you on the authority of God's word because I open up Luke 10. I see Jesus sending out 72 disciples, and I keep going back to Revelation chapter 5, and I see how the throne room of God, all these creatures, they're worshiping God, and it says that there God has redeemed for of a people from every tribe, from every language, from every people, and from every nation. God give me grace. There are some Christians who will get three steps into heaven and think they came to the wrong place. They're going to get in there and say, this don't look like the church I grew up in. Who is that? Where are their shoes? You're going to be worshiping with folks whose dress code freaks you out. You're going to be fellowshipping with tribes that you never knew existed. You're going to sing in song languages you've never heard in your life. Friends, if a multi-ethnic church makes you uncomfortable, child of God, heaven is going to be hell for you. I came here to preach this morning, y'all. I want y'all to praise God. So Jesus tells us that his mission is against the fake peace of the world. It is against the false divisions of this world. And it is also against the phony powers of this age. Now he counters all the immorality, counters the ethnocentrism. He also counters the, the power structures around them, all the powers of the world, the demonic forces in the world. The thing that happens, if you announce that God's kingdom is breaking into the world, you know who doesn't like that message? Anybody with a kingdom <laughs> doesn't like that message. Anybody with power doesn't like to hear that someone with greater power is coming. It is dangerous to say Christ is Lord. Because when they said Christ is Lord, they were also saying Caesar is not Lord. That's a dangerous thing to say. 
It's a, day, it's a weird thing. It's a bold thing to say that peace, salvation is in your house when they are suffering from demonic forces and sickness that they can't get over. Nevertheless, he sends them out. They come back and they're so excited. The, the demons are subject to us. They're so excited about this because they know what it's like. They know what it's like to be under oppressive powers, these people. They know what it's like to live their lives under the powerful thumb of Rome, pressing on them all the time. They know what it's like to live under the threat of somebody with bigger, more swords and pitchforks or whatever or flames and they can come and destroy you. They know what it's like to have somebody else make choices that will affect your life and you are powerless against that. You know what that's like, church, don't you? Some of y'all know what it's like to have somebody else make choices somewhere else and it affects you, it affects your home, it affects your business. You know what it's like to be under the oppressive powers that be and that holds you down. You know what it's like for the powers of death to, to rip someone you love out of your life and you are powerless to change that. I'd be excited too, wouldn't you? The, the, the demons are subject to us. This is amazing. But then Jesus says something countercultural once again. You know, we are in this tug of war of power. I want power. I got to get these are over me. I got to get on top of them. It's just this kind of this always one thing after another of struggle, struggle, fight, fight. But Jesus says something different that should comfort us. He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, a lot of y'all are old enough to remember a man named Joe Namath. I remember him? Okay. John Namath, football player, right? He, uh, and he became very famous as a quarterback. Scotty Smith, I'm sorry to go down this road. Okay. 1969, Joe Namath was the quarterback for the New York Jets. They were the underdog against the, who, the slated to win Baltimore Colts. Okay. Joe Namath made a prediction. He said, I guarantee we will beat the Colts. And doggone it, if they didn't beat the Colts. <laughs> they beat them. He said it. Now, that, that, that's who says that? Who, who has that level of confidence to come in as an underdog and say, we're going to take down the top dog? That could have turned out very differently for Joe Namath. But he took on this mystical aura, this legend. He became a legend overnight because of that. What if Joe Namath had said, I've already beaten the Colts. That goes from legendary to crazy. <laughs> Joe, I think you took a few too many hits on the head, maybe, in that dog pile. I think you're, something's wrong with you, Joe. You're wrong. That is next level confidence, isn't it? But that is exactly the next level confidence Jesus has here. When Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, he's not looking to the past. He's not talking about some origin story of Satan. He's not talking about some past primordial event. He is talking about the promise of Satan's end. Satan hadn't fallen yet. He's in heaven, not like in the throne room of God ruling. He's in the air. He's messing up this world. Ask those demon-possessed folks if Satan had fallen. He's still around, man. And so Jesus, when Jesus sees his disciples coming back, Casting out demons, he said, oh yeah, I say it's over for Satan. He has already fallen. It is so certain that Satan has already fallen. Jesus can speak about the future as if it's the past. That is confidence. What on earth gives Jesus that confidence? He says something weird here. He says, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Reminds me later on when Jesus was resurrected, he said, All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. I did a word study on this, y'all. Marty, I did a word study on this Greek word. Pos is the Greek word for all. This, this is going to blow y'all's mind. Y'all aren't ready for this, okay? The, this Greek word pos, you know, pos, pos upon, Jonathan, all these Greek uh, drills we had to do. This, the meaning of this word for all, this Greek word pos, in Greek, that word for all means all. Okay? It means all. Y'all know what that means? This means that Jesus has all authority. And for this simple Alabama boy, 
when I think, hmm, Jesus has all authority, that must mean nobody else has any authority. Y'all hear me this morning? Nobody else has authority. Did you know that Jesus has authority over everything in the universe? Did you know there is nothing outside the jurisdiction of Jesus Christ? Did you know that Jesus has authority over the United States of America? Did you know this? I don't know that y'all know that. Did you know that? I mean, I hear some of y'all this past week, some of y'all, did you hear about this bill? I don't know about this. I'm concerned. You can be concerned just so long as you know Jesus has all authority over everything. Congress ain't got a drop of authority that, that they don't have from God. He has all authority. The Constitution doesn't have any authority except that we're from God. This Bill of Rights I see plastered on every other pickup in the county, it ain't got any breath of authority if it were not for Jesus Christ. He holds all authority. Do I need to remind you which world ruler was raised from the dead? Do I need to tell you which person is perched at the right hand of God? Do I need to tell you who is going to come and judge the living and the dead? It ain't anybody y'all ever seen on TV, I'll tell you that. His name is Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, he has authority. I'm looking at people this morning. I'm looking at people who have been healed by his power. I see people who have had cancer gone by his power. I know some of you have not had jobs and now you're employed by his power. Some of y'all haven't had a place to live, but now you have a place to live by his power. Y'all didn't have two dimes to rub together. Now you're paying the bills by his power. I want to tell y'all, church, he still has power. Jesus still has sin-forgiving power. Jesus has life changing power. Jesus has repentance power. Jesus has dead raising power and he can raise you this morning, friends. He can meet you in those waters of baptism. You will die in the grave of Christ in baptism and he will bring you up a new person. He's got that power. You don't have that power. You can try to change your life. You can spin your wheels, keep doing those same things you're doing. But only he can change you, friends. Church, the gospel of Christ, a crucified Lord and a risen king, runs counter to the culture around us. It runs counter to what the world says is important, to their values. This is how you get peace. No, friends. It runs counter to the ethnic boundaries and divisions fallen man has set up in our world. It runs counter to the power structures and demonic forces that are present in our world today. So church, I want to tell y'all, let's be a church where no one walks alone, but let's also be a church where we all walk together on mission for Christ. I'm done, church. Y'all get on your feet. Let's sing a song of invitation for anybody who needs it. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His word, what a glory He sheds on our way while we do his good will he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in jesus But to trust and obey, then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he says we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. To trust and obey. 
trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. church where no one walks alone. Y'all see that, right? Okay. Melissa Rabelais comes forward, Jason comes forward, and um, they just need prayers. They, um, we talked about this morning how the culture is against us. You know, we are sheep in the midst of wolves, and the wolves are on them. All right? the, the devil is after their family, and they are fighting, all right? And so we're going to do what we do, aren't we? We're going to rally around this family. And we're going to love them and support them and help them in this fight. Because we've all been there, y'all. Okay? A lot of things. We're fighting. We love you too. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, we, we praise you so much for your goodness. You are, you are the one who is, the one who's present right now. And in this, this struggle and their, their tender hearts, Lord, I pray that you will bless them, you will comfort them, you will give them courage to fight, Lord, to, to keep up that fight, preserve them, take care of them. We know the adversary is always on us, that we can never rest. He pursues us like a roaring lion, trying to devour us, Lord. But I'm so thankful for the bravery of this couple this morning. I'm so thankful for their devotion to you, Lord. And I pray that you will surround them in your power and your love, you'll make your presence known to them, and let the love of this church be known to them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for bringing it. It's good that we're all here. And don't be alarmed by that sound that you hear on the roof. That's an answer to the farmer's prayers. <laughs> We're glad you're here. It's been a good day. Be sure you pick up your bulletins. Uh, it's got all the information of upcoming events and things that are going on. Something I want to bring attention to. Uh, the encouragement class. This coming Tuesday will not meet. We will be preparing the, the meal for Sandra Buck and her family. So if there's anything that you can do to help, if you want to be a part of that, see Noreen Sloan. And if you can assist in preparing that meal for them. Services for Madeline, or Maddie, will be Tuesday at the Coleman Funeral Home in Olive Branch from 12 to 2. So y'all keep this family in your prayers. Keep Melissa in your prayers. And all the, the ones that, and all of our toes that got stepped on this morning by Matthew, let's keep all of each of us in our prayers. 
Because what he said is true. There's only one authority. And we have to answer to that authority when it's our time. We need to be ready. Because it could come in any time. But thanks to this church and our ministers, our teachers, those who lead us are helping us get there. So we're thankful for that. As Matthew mentioned, there will be a couple of small groups that will be meeting right after services this morning. So if you're not involved in a small group, this is an opportunity to check it out, if you will. Um, the rest of the groups will be meeting later on today in different ways. But if you are not a member, if you are not a, currently in a small group, then we invite you to stay to one of these groups that we'll be meeting here and get to, get to know people and get to be a part of that. We encourage that. You'll be blessed by it. If we'll be standing, I'll close this in a prayer. And again, let's keep Medley Morgan, Sandra Buck, Keep them in your prayers. A most gracious Heavenly Father, such a blessing to be called your children. Such a blessing, Lord, to be here this morning, to hear some words of encouragement, some everlasting words. It's what gives us hope. It's what we build our faith upon because we know that you are in control. We know that you will be there for us no matter whatever the situations are. We ask that you be with the Rebella morning, this family this morning. You know their needs, Lord. Melissa, She comes to this church and she's asking for prayers. There's no better place than this. You have told us to love one another as we love you. And as Matthew said, we don't walk alone here. We are here to comfort, we are here to inspire, to uplift each other because we do have those things that pull us away. We do have tribulations and we've been told by Christ, he doesn't say if these tribulations come, he tells us when and how we are to act, and how we are to respond. So I'm thankful for this church and for what it means to this community, to everyone here, and to this world, because we touch a lot of lives. We need to bring more souls back to the fold. So Father, bless us in all that we do. Be with those who are hurting, with those who are mourning. Continue to be an inspiration. Continue to heal. Continue to touch these families. Support them. Comfort them in ways that only you can. But allow us to be a shoulder in that time of need. To be a servant in that time of need. And Father, in all we do, we thank you for your son. It was because of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross who took all the burdens of this world, past, present, and future. And he tells us to come. 
be a part of it. What a blessing. Father, we're thankful for those who have visited with us today, for those who have come our way. And we ask that you give them a speedy return home, if that's where they be. But we also ask that you be with them and return them back to our fold when they have the opportunity. So watch over us, strengthen us, encourage us. For you alone are the Redeemer of all things. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.